Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, December 1944, we're towards the, getting towards the end of the Second World War. The dotted red line up here is the Allied positions as of December 14th. Both the Germans and the Allied forces were supposed to just dig in and kind of wait out the winter, and the Allies were going to take the offensive back in the spring. The Germans had a different, whole different plan in, their, in mind. They were in the process of um, planning what was called Operation Watch on the Rhine, which ended up becoming the famous Battle of the Bulge. At dawn on December 16, 1944, three Panzer armies of the German, of the German army, over, over 500,000 German soldiers, crashed through the Allied lines <coughs> with the goal to take the port town of Antwerp. Antwerp would have been, if it had the Germans been able to take the town, they would have actually been able to get fuel for their panzers with their, or their tanks and actually probably prolong the war another couple of years. Um, they actually, the, the plan was so detailed, the Germans knew how many miles they had to go every day and how, and, and how many gallons of fuel to reach their goal. The main problem that they ran into was this little town right here, Bastogne. December 18, 1944, the 101st Airborne Division, who had won fame at Normandy and who fought and won more f and further fame at Operation Market Garden in September of 1944, was trucked into Bastogne. They were under-equipped for the winter conditions, the winter of 1944. Uh, to date, it was the coldest winter on record, temperatures on average below negative 30. Most of the troopers of the 101st Airborne did not go into combat with proper winter gear. They went into battle in the uniform that I'm wearing, which is the model 1943 uniform. It was a little bit of an upgraded uniform from the 42 uniform that they jumped into Normandy with. They had worn this uniform at Mark Operation Market Garden. It was the first time in military history, in the U.S. military history, that our military actually had one uniform for their airborne forces and their le regular leg infantrymen. Um, the boots stayed the same for the Airborne. They had the famous Corcoran Jump boots that was a badge of office for them. They went through grueling training to earn those boots. And while well, they were supposed to be wearing the double buckle boots that everybody else was given, 90% of the 101st threw those out and wore their jump boots. Um, most of them did not have the wool overcoat, as you see on the mannequin over there. Those were very scarce. They were very rare. Um, they turned in most of their ammo when they were in France. They were on R&R in France at the time that they were called up to Bastogne. And there was paratroopers that went into action at Bastogne that had one clip of ammunition, which is eight rounds for the M1. I know one veteran that I spoke to that fought at the Battle of the Bulge went into the Bulge at Bastogne with one round in his rifle. Within a couple of days' time, the 101st was completely surrounded. The Germans on the 22nd of December demanded the 101st surrender. General Anthony McAuliffe, who was the acting division commander, because General Taylor was actually back in the United States, um, did not know what to say to the German commander's response. His initial response when his um, officer woke him up and his staff and said, they want us to surrender, he said, oh, I'm nuts. He convened his staff and asked what the appropriate response would be because the Germans basically laid it out, surrender or die. McAuliffe was talking to his staff, trying to figure out what his response was going to be, and his staff officer said, Sir, your first response was great. Why don't you just tell him nuts? And the Germans were told nuts. <laughs> and the Germans, as, they, as the German entourage was escorted through the Allied lines, before they crossed back into German lines, the German officer looked to one of the troopers in the 320, or actually the 401st at the time, now that they're designated as a 327, he turned to him and he goes, I don't understand what this nuts is, and... The paratrooper looked at him and said, you're going to find out really quick. <laughs> and every single paratrooper that I've ever met that actually fought at Bastogne for the 101st was resigned to die. They weren't going to give up. And in fact, if you ask a 101st vet that fought at Bastogne if Patton surrendered him, I hope you don't have uh, uh, easily offended ears because they will go off about how they did not need to be rescued by Patton. Patton <laughs> did relieve them by breaking through the encirclement on the 26th of December, the day after Christmas. The Germans, obviously, as you can see, this little bulge right here, this is as far as they got. They ran out of fuel. They actually had to abandon most of their armor. 
And 90% of the German force, by the time we plugged the, the bulge back and re retook our original lines, had been killed, wounded, or captured. The Germans' last gasp of World War II was a resounding failure. One of the reasons was the roads in Belgium were not built to handle the heavy German armor. The Tiger I and the Tiger II tanks were 45-ton war machines. They were gigantic for the time period. And in the Belgian mud and in the snow, they sank. They wasted more fuel trying to pull their tanks out of the mud and get them on roads that were good enough to actually move their armor than they did actually moving. Bastogne, one of the things about it is it was a huge crossroads town. There were seven roads that led in that could handle the German armor, and there were seven roads that went out, all towards their final objective of Antwerp. If the Germans would have been able to take and hold Bastogne, they have access to all those roads. This was a vital point. The Germans actually threw an entire panzer army at the 101st, surrounded them, and essentially got the crap kicked out of them. The 101st Airborne, actually, when they found out they were, sur they were surrounded, one of the officers said, the poor bastards, they got us surrounded. <laughs> Airborne troopers in World War II were actually taught, when you hit the ground, you're surrounded. You have no friendlies around you. That was their mentality. They knew that going in. They were, the original plan was they were just going to hold the town while well, other forces moved up. They did not, nobody counted on how fast the German army was actually going to move. No one even thought the German army could move that fast after basically getting spanked all over France. Once we were able to get break out of the Normandy beachheads, we just we slapped them all over France. We could have won the war had we have avoided Operation Market Garden in Holland in September of 44 a lot sooner. But you have to give the British you gotta let them do something every once in a while, otherwise they get kind of, they get kind of cranky. <laughs> but the Battle of the Bulge actually didn't officially end until the 25th of January of 1945. So over a month that these men were fighting in this brutal cold. The 101st Airborne Division spent over a month outdoors in foxholes. Guys were getting their, their overcoats from wounded and dead comrades that went back to the aid station. Uh, has anybody in here seen the episodes of Band of Brothers when they're in Bastogne and the Battle of the Bulge and stuff like that? That's probably a tenth of what those guys actually went through. Myself as a living historian reenactor, I've spent events where we actually went out. At, it was a tactical event in the winter. And the event organizer said, if you guys are dumb enough to go out there and dig a foxhole and sleep outside, go ahead. And me and one of the guys in the unit that I was in at the time, we went out, dug a foxhole, and woke up with two feet of snow in it. <laughs> and kid you not, we were both under the same blanket, huddled together, freezing, and he was like, you want to go to the car? I said, nope, this is the experience. <laughs> <laughs> but I only did it for a few hours. I can't imagine personally what it was like for those guys to go in that day on the, on the 18th of December and not sleep indoors until almost the end of January. Constantly out in the cold. And my uniform, Gordon, you can verify, this is very thin. This is very thin cotton. If I was lucky, I'd have maybe a pair of long underwear on underneath my trousers. I have a wool shirt on and a t-shirt on underneath that. That was it. I might have a, the troopers might have a scarf. They had gloves. Even the guys that had wool overcoats still froze because it was a stagnant front. They held the line. They couldn't move. There was no retreat into Bastogne. They held an actually a very wide perimeter around the town. They didn't just hold in the town. The Germans hit them repeatedly. In fact, one of the worst days of the, of the Siege of Bastogne was, the, based, technically what would be the last day, was the 25th of December, Christmas Day. The 50, the 50 Deuce, the 502nd Parachute Infantry Regiment, got shelled like there was no tomorrow, and the Germans tried to break through multiple times. At a cost of a lot of paratroopers, the Germans didn't make it through. How thin the lines were around Bastogne because the 101st was so spread out, German patrols and Allied patrols would actually cross each other's lines and cross back and not even realize it. <coughs> There's actually the instance in Band of Brothers where they show a couple of paratroopers and they're walking and one falls into a foxhole and it's a German foxhole. That happened on numerous occasions. You, the, the lines were not 
clear to anybody. There was heavy fog in. If it wouldn't have been for the weather, the weather for the, for the first time in the war, the weather was not on the side of the Allies. There was a heavy fog around Bastogne. In fact, they tried to drop supplies and ammunition to the 101st. They dropped it to the Germans. <laughs> December 25th, the, the fog actually lifted, and they were actually able to airdrop supplies <coughs> and ammunition and food and things like that to the 101st. And the 10th Armor. There was, 10th, there was armor in Bastogne as well. Um, once the, once the 101st actually was relieved out of Bastogne, they actually began taking little towns all along this area here. There was a little town called Foy that they moved, that they moved to the edge of the Bajac war, uh, Forest, which is in the Ardennes. And they assaulted that town in January of 45. And they took two or three other towns before this line was reestablished as where it was originally. And a lot of paratroopers, not just of the 101st, the 82nd was actually up in the St. Vith area, which is in this area right up here. The 82nd got their, their rear ends handed to them on several occasions too, but both divisions held and more American forces were actually able to pull up. When the battle was finally over, declared officially over on the 25th of January, estimated American casualties are between 89 and 105,000. It is the biggest pitched battle the United States Army has ever fought in its history. The Germans, 90% of their force was destroyed. They lost all of their tanks. They lost all of their half-tracks. They lost everything. They lost everything that they needed when they finally started to retreat further and further into Germany that they would have needed to actually make a formidable defense. <coughs> Well, we were actually able to reestablish this line in, in January of 45, of 45, and we went back on the offensive. Well, you can see why the war didn't last much longer. We kind of, again, we did what we did to them in France. We spanked them all over the map. Now, the German forces that actually fought at the Bulge, they were not all crack infantry regiments. There was a lot of conscripts. There was a lot of 16, 17, 14-year-old boys that were called up to do their patriotic service for the fatherland. There was, there was some crack units in there, but a lot of the units that actually fought at the bulge on the German side were a lot of conscript units, some units that didn't see any action until this point. They didn't know what they were doing. There was some units that weren't even trained. They were given a uniform, equipment, taught how to use their rifle, and that was it. They were thrown into the fight. The Germans overall in World War II, if it wouldn't have been for Adolf Hitler, were a very formidable force. Hitler was the entire reason the Germans lost the war. If Hitler would have let his generals do what Eisenhower let his generals do, and that was command, this battle probably would have been a whole lot different. Would have been a whole lot different. The gear that I have laid over here, there's some original pieces, there's some reproductions because originals are either way too expensive to bring out of the house or very, very, very expensive and I can't afford to have them. <laughs> um, every paratrooper, you guys will be able to come up here later on, there's a first aid kit on, my, on the cartridge belt up here. And for the airborne troops, there's actually one up here too. Uh, for the airborne troops, it wasn't just a bandage and sulfa powder, which sulfa powder is a kind of an er early disinfectant. It helped kind of clean the wound out a little bit and kind of slow that infection from starting. There was also morphine surrettes. <clears throat> now these are original morphine surrettes. The one on the right has been partially used. The one on the left has never been used. But actually the 101st, when they went into Bastogne, the medics were actually giving guys shots of morphine to ease the pain from being cold. There was guys that were being taken off the line who literally they hit, their fingers had froze, they couldn't move their fingers anymore. They were beyond, they were beyond frostbite. There was a paratrooper that, rumor is that I've heard from several vets, nobody's ever claimed that it was true, there's never been any evidence, but with the cold I could believe that it was true, that they actually had to amputate his, his lower leg with his boot on because they couldn't get his boot off to take his foot. Because these boots, they are not warm. They are, they are leather, and when leather gets cold, 
so does your foot. And there's no warming them up. They're actually quite comfortable when they're dry. I actually, I love wearing them actually, but um, they are not comfortable when they are wet. And I can tell you that from experience. And even if you're out, when we do tactical events or public events, we do some public events in the wintertime where we do Battle of the Bulge events. And even when you're running in the woods and it's cold, no matter how fast, no matter how much your blood is pumping, your feet are still cold. I was in a firefight one time and I looked at my buddy and I was reloading my rifle and I go, man, I'm warm, but my feet are still cold. <laughs> but it's those little experiences that I can use to relate to you folks what it was like. I can't, gear, I can't sit here and tell you 100% what it was like. I wasn't there. I can give you the history of the bulge. I can give you the, my knowledge for my, my passion and show you my artifacts that I have from the war, but I can't 100% tell you how it was. But if you can think about how cold it's been the last couple of weeks here, it was colder than that in Bastogne. Now imagine going out with a t-shirt on in that weather. T-shirt and jeans and maybe a ball cap, and that was it. You might have an idea how cold those guys were. You guys were lucky. We get to go back inside. We get to go outside, get the mail, and like, okay, we're going back inside. Those guys didn't have that option. Their mail actually came when they were able to get it, and these little guys, little V-mails. Now, the cool thing about the V-mail is this is what they would write on and send home. This is not the size that the person back home would get. They were actually put on a microfilm, and the size that somebody would get at home would be maybe a little bit bigger than this deck of playing cards. And that's how they could transport so many thousands of them overseas. But when they brought it, when they got the, the, the foil strips back here in the States, they were able to print them out, and they were literally no bigger than, than this or an index card. I got a captured war trophy. These were very popular, both Normandy, Holland, all over the place, and especially after the Allies pushed out the the Germans out of the bulge area. There was a lot of stuff left behind. Um, a lot of the GIs actually, when they captured a flag like this, because the flag itself takes up precious space, what they would do is they would actually just cut out the swastika. And that's why you see a lot of things that come up as far as artifacts go. You see very few of the actual full flags. You see just the centerpiece. Because the guys could keep that in a pocket or something like that, where this takes up, this balled up like this takes up some room. The rations that they had were probably not better than, it, probably a little bit better than the MREs that the guys get today. Um, and I've actually survived a weekend on eating reproduction ones of these, and it's not fun. It's not fun. First, first stop after you leave an event, McDonald's. <laughs> but there would be, oh, where is it at? There we go. There was a wax inner box. And the reason this box was wax is if it got, the outer box got wet or your gear got wet, your food would be fine. Nothing else inside would get damaged. You'd actually have to cut the wax to actually open up the outer box or the inner box. There was a cardboard insert. Oh, I gotta stop taking hits on this. With a well, the last time I took a hit at an event, I think I did, I think I dented it. Um, there's a cardboard insert that has your meat in here. Breakfast, it would be like a ham and a cheese. Dinner would be. Um, kind of a turkey, and then you'd have a beef kind of stew for supper. There was no lunch back then. It was dinner and supper, which when I first got into this hobby, I was like, wait a minute, where's, where's lunch? And I had this old vet tell me, he goes, no. He goes, back in my day, we did it right. I'm like, yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's always the famed P38 can opener. It's still going strong today. Various sizes are out there, but that little guy is still going strong. That would actually go in here. If I can get it in here. Of course, nothing wants to behave tonight. 
There we go. And then you would have this little packet. You'd have a orange powder or a yellow powder for your water, kind of like a World War II era Kool-Aid or something like that. You have sugar cubes. You have a stick of gum, a wooden little spoon if you didn't have a mess kit or something like that. You'd have graham crackers, crackers, and then there'd be a little either a cereal bar or a little, it was called a D-ration, and it was a little chocolate bar. One cube was equal to the calories for one meal, supposedly. And then, believe it or not, you'd get cigarettes that was issued. And back in the 40s, Cigarette smoking was actually considered healthy. It was prescribed by doctors. It's supposed to make you breathe better. <laughs> no joke. That is, that is the honest to God truth. I had a vet tell me one time that he was prescribed cigarette smoking to help him breathe better. And, yeah, I don't understand that thought either. But, but that was what was, in the, what was in their rations. Now, typically airborne soldiers would have... Nine boxes, so three days worth of rations. When the hunter first went into Bastogne, if a guy was a guy was lucky if he had one box. They were able to they had to scrounge what they could find on base. And the hunter first when they were they were stationed in France actually when they got the call up to go to Bastogne. Then and like I said, they had turned in their ammunition, they had turned in their first aid kits from Holland, so they had very little morphine. The guys that the guys actually all came together in each company and gave their first aid kits and their morphine and stuff like that to their medics because their medics were so ill prepared. They were they were using it in Bastogne, they were taking sheets off of beds and curtains off of windows for bandages. And that's what our guys would go back when the guys would actually fall back to Bastogne, the medics to get any supplies that they could, they'd come back with a bag full of sheets or a bag full of rags from sheets that had been cut to make bandages, and that's how they were patching guys up on the front lines. Just enough to get them back to the town where they really didn't get any better care except they were actually taken indoors <laughs> and given whiskey. You can win me any day at that point. <laughs> um, does anybody have any questions? Yes, sir. How did the 101st get there? Were they trucked there? They were trucked in. In fact, when the guys got there, they said the, um, Bill Garnier actually, they quote him in Band of Brothers, and he actually said this. He, when they were going into Bastogne, he said, Christ, I missed those C-47s. <laughs> and when they got to Bastogne and they dropped the tailgate, he goes, well, at least it's a tailgate jump and not that and high. <laughs> so, they, and, I mean, they, were, they weren't happy that they were getting trucked in. They... Um, the 101st actually, they preferred to jump. That's, that was their preferred way. That was their badge of honor. It was, it was shown in their boots. It was shown in how they carried themselves. So they actually took it as kind of an offense that they weren't able to jump into Bastogne. But any guy that I ever met that fought at Bastogne, I asked him. I actually asked Frank Bracani a few years before he died. I actually, I'm a, if anybody was here for D-Day, I'm actually originally from the Joliet, Illinois area. And Frank Bracani lived in Joliet. And I was, I, I was lucky enough to meet the man on several occasions. And I asked him, a couple years before he died, I asked him, I said, Frank, would you ever do it again? He goes, what? I go, fight in Bastogne? He goes, in a heartbeat. <laughs> I'm like, even with the cold? He goes, even with the cold. He goes, I'd do it again in a heartbeat. He goes, the only thing I would change is I'd, I'd jump out of a plane. I wouldn't get trucked in. <laughs> but How many are still alive? Out of Easy Company? Out of the best people. Um, as far as the entire division goes, I do not know, but I do know last count for E Company guys in the 506, the Band of Brothers, there was less than 12. Mm -hmm. We actually lost a couple in 2017. So, young man in the back. Um, how did the battle start? The battle started with a surprise German attack on the 16th of December. If you can see, you see this little dotted line right here? Yes. Okay, that is, the, that is the actual Allied line as of December 14th, 1944. Two days later, the German army, you see this solid red line right here? Yes. The German army slammed through this area. And nobody knew they were coming. Nobody knew they were coming. It was, 
we got caught with our pants down and they pushed us, I, I want to say off the top of my head, I think they pushed a 60 mile bulge into our lines before we were actually able to start stopping them and slowing them down. So they actually, I mean, for being able to catch us off guard, they actually made good headway. If they wouldn't have ran out of fuel for their armor, there's a very good chance that because of the initial assault, they could have taken Antwerp. Yes, sir. From what I read, they should have known they were coming. The the people that were doing the uh, the guys that were going out night patrols yep. would come back and report something funny. None of the roads had snow on them. Yep. Because the Germans were moving. And nobody took them seriously. No snow on the roads in the winter. Yep. Wrong there. And nobody took them seriously. The locals were telling people <coughs> there's something going on. And they, the best and, key, all the wildlife was running like it was crazy. Well, if you've ever heard a uh, a Tiger One uh, engine rev up, that's loud. And the sounds. Yep. But there, there were clues. But there was a lot missing. of clues, but I think everybody, the conclusion that has kind of been reached in the, I don't want to say the World War II community, so to speak, amongst us living historians, reenactors, researchers, whatever you want to call us, has been that we were actually kind of blinded by our own bravado that the war was basically over and that the Germans might be moving things back and forth but there was nothing that they could do to launch an offensive and then when they came pounding through our lines the blind saw really quick <laughs> let's just say that um, but yeah like you said there was a lot of signs that you know there was no snow on the roads the roads were muddier than they should have been both the, the Allies thought the Germans were going to just dig in and kind of wait out the winter because it was going to be such a bad winter. And in fact, where they actually attacked in the Arden sector for the Allies was actually supposed to be R&R &R for a lot of guys. A lot of the units that were actually af affected on, a, on the Allied side had fought in the Hurtgen Forest, had fought all through Normandy, had fought in the campaigns in Europe while the Airborne was fighting in Normandy, or in uh, Holland, excuse me. So these were tired infantry, regular leg infantry divisions that were sent to the Ardennes sector because it was supposed to be so quiet and it was they were going to have a nice winter. It didn't happen that way, unfortunately, but that was yes. Sir. That's why the terms were stuffed in, or their ammo was stuffed in. Well, the hundred when the, when the airborne forces in World War II are a lot <coughs> different than they are now. Their, their objectives in World War II, was, like in Normandy, they were supposed to link up with infantry, be relieved, and pull off the line. They carried everything they needed, weapons, ammo, for about three days fighting. So essentially when they linked up with infantry, they were supposed to be exhausted on food, water, and ammo. So when they were actually pulled off the line and sent back to France, we had already taken France. There was no reason to have guys, you know, with full, you know, cartridge belts and things like that. There was guys that actually went to Bastogne that actually didn't have a weapon. That actually got their weapon from retreating infantry. I want I I don't remember the infantry division it was off the top of my head that the 101st ran into when they were walking into Bastogne. But they were as they were walking out of Bastogne, the 101st was walking in. These infantry guys were telling them, "You're going to die." And the officers were communicating with the officers of the 101st and telling them they came at us with. Tigers, Tiger Twos, Panthers, they came at us with artillery, everything they could throw at them. And these infantry guys were so dazed and so shell-shocked that they, they didn't even realize the, GI, the airborne guys were taking their gear off of them to get ammo and weapons. So it was, I mean, the Germans caught us, they caught us good. I mean, they really did. I mean, you got to tip your hat to your enemy. And when it comes down to it, yeah, the Germans were fight were the line German soldier was not fighting for Adolf Hitler. He was fighting for he was fighting for Germany just like the guys were in the screen eagle were fighting for the United States. And in fact, to be in the German military, unless you were a very high up general, you could not be a member of the Nazi Party. You could the, the belief was you could not serve the party and the state. You served one or the other. So technically, if somebody tells you or somebody mentions to you that this is the Nazi army, they're 99% wrong. The higher up generals were members of the party. That was almost a requirement to be an army commander. But the regular captains, lieutenants, 
NCOs, privates of the line, could not be a member of the Nazi party. Not saying that, they didn't, that some of them didn't harbor the beliefs. I'm not saying that at all. But technically, if you want to get down to it, and I'm not defending Nazi Germany by, for what they did at all. Don't get me wrong. But this is the German army, not the Nazi army. The SS, then. the SS were actually shock or originally shock troopers. Um, there was two branches of the German German military. You had the Wehrmacht and the Heer, which was basically the same thing. To serve in those, you had to trace your line, your family lineage, all the way back to Germany. If you couldn't trace your family back to Germany, you fought in the SS. There were some crack SS divisions. Um, you had the second SS. You had the second SS Panzer Division, which was a very crack unit. You had the 17th SS Panzer Division, who the 101st tangled with and destroyed at the Battle of Bloody Gulch in June of 1944, um, about a week after D-Day. You have the 9th SS Panzer Division. Um, is three of the ones that are off the top of my head, but for the most part, the only SS unit that technically was not part of the military was the Algemein SS, Hitler's personal bodyguard. Those, every single one of those officers, NCOs, and enlisted were not only members of the Nazi party, believed the Nazi ideology, and were willing to die for Adolf Hitler to the man. But the Algemein SS never saw line combat. Their job was, unfortunately, not only did they guard the camp, not only did they guard Adolf Hitler, but they actually were guards at some of the camps. But most of your, I went on to say about 95% of your SS was Czechs, Poles, Jews. There were actually Jews that fought for the German army. Um, anybody that were, when your country was taken over, the Germans replenished their ranks by saying, you're going to fight or your family's going to die. And if you couldn't trace your family line back to Germany, you were put in an SS division. So where's Patton in all of this? Oh, you've had to ask that question today. <laughs> <laughs> Patton was over here and he was saying it. No, I'm just kidding. Um, Patton actually did a full 360 turn with his army, with the third army, to relieve the infantry at Bastogne. And he was told, get there when you can. Patton told him he'd be there in three days. He broke through the German lines and relieved pressure on the 101st on December 26, 1944. <coughs> Three days after, his army made the big, their big left turn. Because Pat, Patton's army was actually down, down in this area over here, causing havoc for the German forces that were still in that area. And when the Third Army was given the orders to relieve Bastogne, those men didn't sleep. Those men that actually marched with Patton that day, those three days, hated the man after it. My, um, my mother had, I want to say it was a, her, one of her uncle's dads or something like that, was one, of, was one of Patton's Jeep drivers. And he said if he could have crashed the Jeep and killed the son of a bitch without killing himself, he would have done it. <laughs> Patton's own men hated him. And loved him at the same time because Patton... He didn't, care, he didn't care one thing for the line infantrymen underneath him. All Patton cared about was victory. But where his men loved him, Patton was never defeated. And Patton always led from the front. He was in his dress uniform at all times, but he always led from the front. Those are the reasons his men loved him. Those are the reasons his men would die for him and fight for him like they fought. But if you ask him, if you ask what a the guys who fought in the Third Army with Patton, what their personal opinion of him was. Again, hope you don't have ears that are easily offended. Because <laughs> there's very little love for the, for the man as a person. Yes, sir? Was it Melody, was it, or the SS squad that committed the atrocities? Yes, there was, I want to say it was 89, or it was 80, either 87 or 89 American prisoners of war were rounded up and brutally murdered. And it was, it was called the, the Melmody Massacre. Yep. And that was an SS unit that did that. But it's really, and again, I'm not, I'm not excusing the atrocity, but the Germans were under the same orders that the 101st and 82nd were at Normandy. No prisoners. 
They didn't have they didn't have the time and the resources to worry about prisoners because that was men out of the line, and that was fuel to transport prisoners back. When the 101st and 82nd jumped in in Normandy, their orders were no prisoners. If a German stuck his hands up to surrender, you shoot him. So, well. The massacre at Malmedy is exactly what it was, a massacre. In reality, it's no different than when our guys jumped in Normandy and Ronald Spears, Band of Brothers, if you've seen that, that episode at, where he supposedly killed those German prisoners, Spears admitted that he did it because he was following their orders. They were under orders to not take prisoners at that point because nobody knew once the airborne took off if the seaborne invasion was going to happen. Now that, again, I am not saying that that is okay for the Germans to do what they did. Neither one was right. Neither one was right. If you're going to surrender, you take a prisoner. That is my personal belief. I, I believe both instances were both atrocities. But we're no better than the Germans at Malmedy, at Normandy. So Normandy is the June before this? Yes, June of 44. The Day of Days, as it was nicknamed. Yes, sir. Were there any British units or anything? There were. Um, the area that the Germans actually hit was mostly American. The British casualties, I believe, numbered actually less than 10,000 by the time the battle was over. The British were very, very limited in their engagements in the battle, in this area of the bulge. Once we went back on the offensive, then everybody's casualties went through the roof again. But as far as plugging the bulge back up and stuff like this, this was just a solid American sector. But you did have British that were killed and wounded fighting in the bulge. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Let's say the Germans actually took Antwerp. What was their plan for getting oil? How was that going to help it, them? It's hard to tell on this map here, but Antwerp is actually a port. Right. But there, so where was it coming from? We had ammo dumps. We had ammo and fuel dumps there. That's why they were going for the port of Antwerp. Okay, so they were going to steal our supplies. They were, going to, they were basically trying to steal our supplies. And they knew the Germans actually pulled some really good espionage during the Battle of the Bulge. They actually had platoons of Germans that were perfect accents. They could speak English fluently. You'd never know they were German. They wore the same uniforms. That they, got, they got their hands on our uniforms, whether it was infantry, airborne, whatever. And they wreaked havoc behind our lines. They turned road signs around. They got copies of our maps because officers would come up and start talking to each other, and you don't realize you're actually talking to a German spy. The Germans knew where all of our, or all of our fuel dumps were in this area prior to their assault, because this was all going on before the assault. So they knew they had to hit the fuel dumps that were here and in this entire area. They knew all the fuel dumps were to get to Antwerp. And it was enough fuel to get them to Antwerp to get the bulk of what was left of the Allied fuel in that area. It wouldn't have done much in the long run. The Germans wouldn't have been able to push the Allies back into the sea by any means. But it would have, if they would have taken Antwerp, they probably could have delayed the war probably another year and a half to two years, at least on this front. So, I mean, but yeah, I mean, the Germans, and actually when the German prisoners were, are the, Spies were actually caught. They were shot. It is actually against the Geneva Convention to conduct espionage like that, where you don somebody else's uniform and you, you're no longer considered a spy at that point. Um, I don't know exactly the article or anything like that in the Geneva Convention to quote it, but they were actually executed as um, war criminals, not spies. But they were, do I mean, the, I mean, the guys that I, that I talked to that fought in the bowl is not just that fast stone that met these guys, that remember talking to these guys, you never know. They never slipped once. They had perfect accents. Just like, we're talking to each other right now. You never know. I could be German. You wouldn't even know. They started actually asking questions about who won the World Series, who, who starred in this movie, who's Betty Grable married to, who's this, who's that. And if you got the answer wrong, you were taken prisoner. Because once we realized what was going on, nobody knew how many of these Germans were behind our lines or where they were or anything like that. So we started asking questions to people that only true Americans would know. And if you didn't answer the question, right, there was actually a general who actually answered a question wrong and got arrested 
And it actually, he was proven to be an American general, but I bet you that sergeant that did that was a private the next day. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, there was a lot of, the Germans ran a lot of espionage back then, you know, during that campaign. Any uh, other questions? Uh, isn't, that, uh, isn't that also the thing that happened after uh, one picture from the Vietnam War? What was that? It was the picture that supposedly ended the Vietnam War was the, pretty much it was a general blowing out of spies' brains. Yep. That is when public opinion in the United States turned heavily on. But what people don't realize is that that was not a South Vietnamese general. That was a Viet Cong shooting another Viet Cong. So it was put, propaganda. To put this in perspective, I know your expertise is Europe, but what's happening in the Far East at this time? Is in, the, in the Pacific? Yes. We're yeah. spanking the Japanese all over. But that's still, they're still fighting. Oh yeah, they're still fighting. Actually, the war in Europe ended in May of uh, 45. We didn't end the war in, in the Pacific until August of 45. Yeah. Uh -huh. And that took two atomic bombs. And, the and it should have only taken one, but even after the first one, the Japanese were like, ha-ha, we're not surrendering. And then they dropped the second one. They're like, okay, we give up. <laughs> but Tokyo was the next one. I just read that the other day. Tokyo would have been the next target. Mm -hmm. Yep. I don't think they had a third bomb ready. They didn't. They but didn't Tokyo would have been the third, they, they was the third target. I don't know if it's true or not, Maybe but I read that Truman was the best no. poker player. <laughs> what did you say, sir? I'm sorry. I read that poker uh, that Truman was a good poker player. He claimed he had ten bombs ready to drop. Yep. And they didn't have any more. No, they only had the two. They only had Fat Man and Little Boy. And um, yeah, and Tokyo would have been the third target if we would have had a third bomb. But thank God it only took two. And actually, the Purple Hearts that they're still issuing to our guys today were actually, unless they've exhausted them, hopefully they didn't, um, were actually manufactured for the invasion of Japan. They estimated American casualties to invade man mainland Japan was going to be over a million men killed or wounded. Because it would just be like invading the United States. There's a gun behind every blade of grass in the United States. They're, the people of Japan were being taught by their government to defend from an American invasion. And the bombs were, I would consider the bombs an atrocity personally because it was civilians that were affected. But the bombs, I'm going to say it, if you, a few hundred thousand versus a million, I'll take the few hundred thousand to be honest with you. Our guys are worth a lot more than that. So the bombs saved over a million of our guys' lives. I mean, they were, the 101st after, after May of 45, they started gearing up to get redeployed with the 82nd to the Pacific Theater. They were starting to gear up to transfer units from Europe to the Pacific because that war was not easy enough. Who was the main uh, German commander the Battle of the Bulge? The Battle of the Bulge, the German commander, um, von Rutstein. He was the he was the overall German commander of Army Group West, which was. Basically, this is the Western Theater. He was the head honcho for the Western Theater. Russia and all of that was considered the Eastern Front. This is the Western Front, and then when they invaded Russia, that was the Eastern Front. So Army Group West would have been under uh, General von Rundstedt. Yes, ma'am? Is there a big cemetery there at Bastogne? Um, not at Bastogne. Um, there, are, there are several cemeteries in Belgium. Um, I have not been to them. I there's have actually. German, there's German cemeteries in Belgium also. Yes, there's actually German cemeteries in um, Normandy as well. Mm -hmm. um, I have not been to any of them. I've actually been to the Sicily Rome Cemetery in Italy, and there's seventy seventy seven hundred crosses there, and I couldn't. Imagine going to like Normandy or the ones in Belgium because they're bigger. I think in um, Rome Sicily Cemetery, I know it's a whole different theory of the war, but I think there's 22 sets of brothers that are buried there. There's a couple of Medal of Honor winners that are buried there. There's there's a few father and sons that are buried there. There's a whole B-17 bomber crew that's buried next to each other. 
it took me probably three hours to walk three sections. And I couldn't get through the rest of it. I just ran out of time. I could have spent, I could have spent all day there. <laughs> um, I stopped at every single cross. Every single cross. But yeah, there are, in Belgium, there are um, both Allied and German cemeteries. Yes, sir? We're uh, north of Cologne. Is that the Dresden where the firebombing took place? Yes. It is? Yep. When, what was the time of the firebombing? The firebombing was actually... Is that before this? I want to say it was before this. Okay. Yeah. Young man, I saw your hand up, but... Um, like, what? I won grand on, on the Battle of the Bulge. M1 Grand. Is it okay if you hold, when you pull your thumb out? This actually has enough force to shatter your thumb. Yep. Yep, it's wow. called M1 thumb. Yep. I have actually suffered in a couple of occasions. And it is not fun. There we go. There you go, bud. Now you've not even now that you've seen an M1 up close, you've held one. <laughs> But this was the, as Pat so eloquently, eloquently put it, the weapon that won the war. Yep. This one was manufactured in January of 1943. Who built it? This is made by Springfield Armory. Springfield. Yep. Would they, would they put bayonets on the end of those? Can they would have. Um, you have the ability to. Actually, there's a bayonet up here on the, on the, on the web gear. There was only a few instances in World War II where there was actually bayonet charges. One of them actually got Lieutenant Colonel Cole, who was a commanding officer of the 502nd in Normandy, the Medal of Honor. He was actually killed in Holland by a sniper directing his troops. And he had found out about getting the Medal of Honor, I think, a day or two before he was killed. But he actually led a bayonet charge in Normandy and completely took the Germans by surprise. And then there was another instance in the, during the Battle of the Bulge. It wasn't airborne troops. It wasn't, well, it was, but it wasn't 101st or 82nd. It was a parachute infantry battalion. I don't remember who it was. But they were outnumbered. And the only way that they were going to get out was either retreat or charge. And they charged. They had no ammunition, so they only had, they had two options. And they fixed bayonets, and they took the German positions foxhole by foxhole, hand-to-hand -hand with bayonets and, and anything else they could find. And they were outnumbered and they still did it. Yes, sir? Was, uh, um, all, most of the ammo was 7.62, but was the German ammo that also? The German ammo was 8 millimeter Mauser, oh. which is very close to 7.62. Our ammunition for the M1 was 30 out 6. The uh, M1 Garand was 30 out 6. The M1 carbine was 30 carbine. The Thompson and the 45, the 1911, were 45 caliber. And then the BAR, which was the equivalent to today's saws and M60s and stuff like that, was uh, 30 out 6 as well. Didn't the clip have five rounds? You said eight. No, nope, it has eight. It did. Yes. <laughs> yep, eight clip, eight rounds. Maybe I never counted them. <laughs> I know I put a lot of them in, but I, I thought they were five. Well, I can tell you from my experiences as just as a reenactor, you know, yes, our combat is more simulated than anything, but when we get into a pitched firefight, sometimes you actually forget that you're um, recreating something and you kind of almost get teleported back to that time period. And there's been times that I, I swear to God I put a brand new clip in and I pulled the trigger three times and my weapon was empty. And I'm like, crap, trying to get into my pouch to pull out another one. And, you know, just for that split second, you kind of get that fear that those guys felt on a regular basis of, you know, my weapon's empty, now I'm going to die. Yeah. And, you know, I, I have such I have, I've, you can tell I have a passion for this. I love what I do. Um, but I'll tell you, those moments, when you're going through them, you hate them. But when you can talk to folks like you guys and relay, you know, try to try to tell these guys stories who aren't here anymore, those are some good times. You know, when you think about it, you're like, wow, I actually kind of have an idea what it was like to be out of ammo under fire or 
be that guy telling my unit commander, hey, I'm out of ammo, I gotta get out of here, and you have some ammo or something like that. I mean, my buddy and I, we were at a Battle of the Bulge event a few years ago, and we just threw all of our ammo in an ammo can, and we were getting assaulted by the Germans, and the guys that were to our left and right thought me and him had a 30 caliber machine gun, and we had two M1s cooking off. And we were just bam, 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 ping, bam, 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 bam. It, it, we just, we, we timed our, our firing perfect. Everybody, when the battle was over, all the other GIs were, and even the Germans were like, where's the 30 cal? We're like, what 30 cal? They're like, you guys, what, how many rounds they had us? We're like, we just staggered our fire. But you'd be, sur I mean, you can go through a lot of ammo. I mean, there's just that 20 minute firefight between the two of us where we went through 500 rounds. Right. And my, we adapted our M1s. There's actually a little sleeve in the, in the breach. It doesn't damage the weapon at all. It's a little bit of Loctite that keeps it in. It adapts to shoot 308. Live rounds, it doesn't cycle worth a dang. But for blanks, it's nice because we can get our blanks for five cents a round. So when you're blasting 500 rounds between two guys, you're like, hey, 20 bucks, we're good. <laughs> so, but we go out and, you know, we do, we experience as much as we can and talk to the veterans as much as we can, especially, you know, since the World War II guys are getting fewer and fewer every year. So, you know, when we see a World War II vet, you know, we, we might see him, you know, three or four times in a year. We always think, hey, that could be the last time I talk to that guy. You know, you got to always be careful when you're talking to him. You don't want to constantly ask him questions because you're gen you, you, obviously we genuinely care. But they're also our, they're also our very good friends. You know, we, we love these guys like there's no tomorrow. See, now, uh, I had an uncle that was in the 82nd, and he always told me that um, there was some resentment with the glider troopers. Yes. But he said when they got there, the 82nd, when they found out what these gliders could bring in, now they were their best friends. Yep. The glider riders and the airborne hated each other yeah. immensely. And it was, in so, it was more from the glider riders hating the airborne because the airborne troops, to be a true paratrooper, it's all volunteer. You, you're not, in World War II, if you were, you know, yes, we ran the draft, but draftees were not put into the airborne. The glider troops that were assigned to the 101st and the 82nd, they didn't get a choice. They were told, hey, look, you're dressed like an infantryman. We're going to put this airborne patch on your shoulder. And we're going to put you in a controlled crash. Go have fun. <laughs> That's exactly what it was. But the gliders could carry a lot. They could carry jeeps. They could carry small artillery pieces. They could carry ammunition. They could carry food. They can carry, you know, anything that they could think of almost in these gliders. And the gliders, it literally is a controlled crash. I've met a couple of glider pilots in my life, and I asked them, I said, what was it like flying? And he goes, no, we crashed it. He goes, we were just taught how to crash it. I'm like, wouldn't want to do that. But around the time of... The Battle of the Bulge, the glider troops, they actually started getting treated more like airborne. The, the airborne troops got paid $50 a month for being an infantryman. But because of their airborne status, they got an extra 50 bucks a month. They got 100 bucks a month. The glider riders, up, into, up until the winter of 44, were only getting 50 bucks a month, even though they were in an airborne division. And now they were actually given that f extra 50 bucks. And when the gliders, like you were saying, when the gliders started bringing in, not so much to the 101st because the 101st was surrounded, but with the 82nd, the glider riders started getting a lot of respect throughout the airborne ranks. And in fact, to go back a little bit into Normandy, the 82nd uh, glider infantry, the 325th, actually was very responsible for the fighting at Lafayette Causeway, which opened the door for the 82nd Airborne to start achieving, uh, achieving their objectives in Normandy. So the 82nd glider riders didn't have as much animosity as the 101st glider riders did. Yes, sir? Uh, I always thought that gliders were a one-way trip. Were they ever reused? Nope. It was, one it was, it was a one-way trip. It was a controlled crash. And in fact, if you've seen pictures of the fields and stuff like that around Normandy, the big telephone poles sticking out of the, the ground was made for a glider attack because they would just shred a glider. And there was, they're, hard, they're very hard to find pictures because they are very gruesome pictures of gliders that actually landed in these fields in Normandy and there is nothing left of the gliders and you can pick out 
forgive me for saying this, you can pick up bits and pieces of what was left of the troopers. Because the guy, I mean, it wasn't just the poles, it was also razor wire, it was barbed wire, it was just regular telephone wire. Because coming down at the speeds they came down at was enough where they should be cut to ribbons. And it, I mean, they're, they're gruesome pictures. I don't want to ever say encourage somebody to see that, but if you really want to understand the risk that, especially in the Normandy campaign, that the Airborne took both 82nd and 101st and the British 6th Para Infantry, look up those pictures. Look up the pictures of the crashed C-47s. Look up the pictures of the crashed um, gliders that met those fields. And you'll see the sacrifices that those guys volunteered to do. My, not the glider riders. They didn't volunteer for that, those poor guys. But those airborne troops, when they jumped out of those planes, whether it was Normandy or Holland or later on in the 17th Airborne actually jumped in Germany, they took that risk. No, they, they took those jumps knowing the risk that it entailed. And when the planes got hit, those guys inside didn't have a chance to get out. Any other questions? One second. Yes, sir. Your flight there, where'd that come from? That is actually a reproduction. That is a very well-made reproduction from a company that repros a lot of uniforms and equipment for reenactors and living historians called At the Front. They did a very small run of those. And once they were gone, they were gone. And I was like, yeah, buy one. <laughs> so it, it's kind of a touchy thing to put out, but it's, it's part of the history. And if you don't know where you've been, you're going to repeat it. And there was a question over here. Have you served in the military? Uh, no, ma'am. Well, that's why I'm just thinking. You know so much about it, so I'm, just, I'm impressed with that. This is this is called having no friends growing up. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, no, actually, that is not that that is actually not too far from the truth. Um, I have a <coughs> deep passion for our history. I actually I reenact Civil War, World War II, and Vietnam. And um, I actually run my own Vietnam Living History Unit, that we were the ones who did the living history with the VFW at the railroad depot in May of last year. Oh, okay. Yep. Okay. Um, so I have a extensive collection that my poor wife has to deal with. <laughs> um, and I know every couple of weeks I get another box. She's like, she'll call me at work. I'm like, yeah, you got a box. <laughs> I know. Why didn't you tell me about it? Because I knew this was going to happen. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I, uh, I put a lot of time into it. This isn't something that I just wake up one day and say, oh, I'm going to do a five-minute presentation. And so, yes, sir. I think I read someplace where it said that on D-Day, a lot of the major Nazi higher-up uh, generals and stuff, uh -huh. they were attending uh, something going on. They were, they were actually training. They were doing war games. Yeah. Do you, did anybody ever come up and say that? It might have changed the outcome had they been closer to the... It actually action. wouldn't have. What would have actually changed the outcome of the Normandy invasion is if Hitler would have been awake no. and not taken... No, in all honesty, Hitler was in Berlin took a sleeping pill. And he was sound asleep with orders not to wake him until he awoke. Okay. And the German army operated under what was called the Fuhrer Principle, which any major military decisions had to be passed through him first. Rommel knew... He had an idea of where the Allies were going to hit. He didn't know 100%, but he had an idea. And there was reserve panzer divisions. I want to say it was, it was either three or five that were in the Calais area. That was where the original thought was going to be because it was the shortest point between England and France. Mm -hmm. We actually chose the widest point between England and France in Normandy. Um, when, Hitler got, when Hitler found out about the invasion, he was skeptical. He thought the Normandy landings, even with the paratrooper drops the night before, were a complete feint that the actual landing was going to happen at Calais and that Patton was going to be in charge. He delayed giving Rommel permission to release the reserve panzer divisions to move them into Normandy. If they would have been released two days prior, Normandy could have been a whole different ballgame. The Germans would have had enough troops to push our flank back into the sea and put up a very... They put up a great defense, don't get me wrong, especially when you get into the bocage and all the hedgerows and stuff like that. But they could have actually almost stopped us at the beaches. Mm. And because Hitler had everything go through him, that is what actually lost the Normandy campaign for the Germans, is Hitler having to say, yes, release the reserve panzers. And it took him two days 
And then it took them another two days to get there. So four days, we're, it's June 10th. We're already in. We're heavy fighting. We're pushing inland day by day. There was nothing the Panzer Divisions could do except just be cannon fodder at that point. But if they would have come in four days earlier, they could have pushed our flight <coughs> back into the sea, and the German army had a very good opportunity to push us back, and who knows how, how long World War II would have kept going. We might have had to end World War II in both theaters of the bomb. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir? Um, you've got, on the map there, you've got some uh, lines for medium bomber range, heavy bomber range. Uh, was that any significant part of the Battle of Bulge? Towards the end. Um, once the fog lifted on the um, 25th of December, and our air power started coming in more into play, because one of the things that everybody thinks, like, the, okay, the Germans were stopped here. Bastogne could have been actually relieved a lot sooner if our air cover would have been able to get through and bomb the hell out of the Germans. But because the weather was so bad, it was the first time in the war where our air power meant nothing to us. We had air superiority, and God was against us at this point. But once that weather broke and we were actually able to get our C-47s to start dropping supplies and we could start getting the bombers, that's what started helping to turn tail. That's why we were able to close the breach so quick. And I know a month and a half doesn't sound like it, it's quick, but when you got muddy roads, you got German armor in the way, you know, broken down tanks in the way, and you got to figure out ways around them, we plugged that hole pretty quick. I know I mentioned Dresden earlier. Now, somewhere I'd read that the firebombing in Dresden had actually killed more people than the dropping of the atomic bomb. Yes, it did. Okay. Yep, because we hit Dresden with everything we could think right. of. I mean, and it wasn't just, I mean, we, can't, we, just, we hit them with all of our bombers. And I know when you hear how horrifying that Nagasaki was and, and this atomic bomb, but, you know, Dresden in reality was, was way much worse. worse. Yep. Right. Yep. The thing, what makes the atomic bombs a little bit more, I don't want to use the word humane, is that most of the initial people were pretty much vaporized when it hit. Right. They didn't even know what hit them. The ones that suffered and stuff like that, that's horrible. But those, the people in Dresden, when we were firebombing them, they, they knew what was hitting them. Right. You know, they had nowhere to go. They had, you know, they heard the planes and they knew it was coming. The Japanese didn't hear the plane. Right. You know, so not trying to make one sound better than the other, but... You know, just as a Is comparison. Is there a reason that the U.S. picked Dresden? Was that a strategic... Dresden concept? was actually a, um, if I'm not mistaken, it was a manufacturing hub. Was it? Okay. Yep. And in fact, um, good old Mr. Ford, who I'm, I have to admit I drive a Ford F-150, and I have to admit this, told um, President Roosevelt that if he bombed any of his plants in Germany, he would, pull, he would stop production in the United States. <laughs> Henry Ford made, made arms and munitions for both sides during World War II. He had plants in the United States, and he had plants in Germany. <laughs> And he told Roosevelt, if you bomb one of my plants in Germany, I will cease production in the United States. <coughs> Henry Ford was actually a very strong supporter of Adolf Hitler. He gave thousands and thousands of dollars to Hitler prior to World War II. I know there's a question back there. Yeah, the Tiger, did that have an 88? Cannon? Yes, the Tiger One and the Tiger II, the King Tiger, had it, both had 88s on it. So what's firebomb? I don't know what that is. Basically, you carpet bomb, and it's just wave after wave after wave of bombers, and they just drop tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of... But that was more, not high explosive. It, it was incendiary. Fire bombs. Fire bombs. Started fire. Yep. Yeah. Okay. They did, when, they, when they exploded, they'd start buildings on fire, and they'd start anything that could, that could be combustible would either explode or would start on fire, and okay. yeah. And it was hundreds of thousands of tons, and wave after wave after wave of... B-25s, B-17s, British bombers. And, and I think the net result is the, the fire consumes so much of the oxygen, there's nothing left for the people. Right. Yep. It's a hor it, yeah, and I have to imagine it's a horrible way to die. Yeah. Any other questions? Bueller? <laughs> okay, some people know that, thank God. I did, I, no, I did a World War II presentation at my old high school. I go back to Illinois twice a year and do Vietnam presentations and World War II presentations at my old high school for all their history classes. And when I ask for questions, when it gets this quiet, I go, Bueller, 
Bueller. In the last couple of years, everybody's looking at me. I'm like, oh boy. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, okay. I'm like, and then I gotta ask them, who's seen that movie? And a couple kids have put their hands in the air. I'm like, okay, I'm getting old. <laughs> Any other questions? All right. Thank you. Good job.